Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Cat Class Podcast. I'm Josh. I'm Jake. And it is awesome to be with you all. Uh, we are looking forward today. We have a great episode. Last week, we got some excellent feedback. Oh, let's silence this phone in the background. Last week, we got some excellent feedback about uh, you guys enjoyed this stream. So what we hope to do is hop back in, answer some CAD questions. We're going to talk a bit of philosophy. And we're going to show off some awesome projects. So if you have questions, hey, look at that. We actually do see the comments. By the way, last Finally. week we missed all of your comments. I'm so sorry. We think we got that sorted out. So uh, please do say hello in the chat. We love interacting with you. We're going we're gonna to talk through some of the issues that have come up on Discord. But uh, the best thing is to interact with you all to hear the questions that you have live. So if you have a question, a thought, an idea, a comment, anything you'd like to share with us, please do so in the comment section. And with that, Jake, I figure, hey, Joe Street. Actually, I was just looking through some of our projects. Uh, and I saw I saw one of your older projects on the I Made a Thing list. So uh, really awesome to have you on the stream. Uh, but Jake, so let's dive in as, as we're getting I, warmed up. Here. I think uh, just, just for the new people that are coming in here. So uh, normally for our course, we have uh, two separate classes a week where we always go into an office hour session where people have questions about the course, people have questions about any of the projects, maybe their own personal projects, and we can share our screen, share their screen, et cetera, and kind of have a very more, more of an intimate one-on-one -on -one, uh, about what's going on uh, with their project, where they may be going wrong and where we can help essentially. Uh, we wanted to break this out uh, so we uh, kind of share the love to everyone a little bit. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about any projects in specific um, or really any maker philosophy, any 3D printing upsets, anything like that, we want to hear it. So we already have a question in the chat. We were going to start with our own, but um, it's actually related to something we talked about last week. But let's yeah. uh, let's hit it briefly. I just shared it there on the screen. So hello, Jake and Josh. Can you touch on the project include intersect a bit? Is it a tool only used in a sketch? And will it be used in future projects with your course? Best regards from Al. Thanks for the question, Al. Thanks very much, Al. So the project tool is a really funky one. We touched on it last week. And it's really strange because there's two different types of projections. Projection from one sketch to another plane, which uh, you can kind of think of like a shadow or a projector casting some information over here to another plane over there. And you go, okay, well, I kind of understand that. Uh, if you have two offset planes and you're projecting a circle, it doesn't matter how far away this offset plane is, it's going to be sending that circle uh, onto the other place. That's pretty obvious. That makes sense. Uh, that's incredibly useful. If you're making a project on multiple levels, uh, that becomes unbelievably useful. Uh, the downside to the project tool, even though it is massively useful, is that it doesn't update. So if you were to then move that circle, you know, 20 mil to the left, for example, uh, that projected purple circle does then not shift over. It will kind of hold in place. A little bit of the downside, but it just means that you need to be a little bit more organized in your sketching. Uh, the other half of the project tool is that you can project something onto the exact same surface that it's already on, which is a little bit of a funky thing. Uh, we went over it uh, with the Saturn V rocket last week, where uh, as you make your first tapered cylinder, you can actually project to uh, actually have some profiles that you can select. So if you go back, uh, I believe it's in chapter zero, uh, is when we touch on that. That's a really important section. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. Uh, and then we can go into actually uh, just a really quick recap uh, into all that stuff. Um, so if I just go into um, projects, where are we going? Uh, then I'm just going to go up and up the Sat5 rocket. There we go. And I'll just do a little recap really quick. So this is our project that you have in the first week. Uh, and I believe the first tapered cylinder is right here. Um, as we talked about last week, uh, you can see that we actually have two purple circles. These are projected uh, profiles that we have on this surface. And the idea is that at the very end, we want to have uh, this nice tapered cylinder that essentially comes off of uh, an empty tube. You can see all the way through there. Uh, this cylinder wants to be 30 millimeters tall with a negative 16 degree taper. Um, 
the down or, or the reason that we use the projectile in this scenario is if you just try and extrude uh, this surface up 16 millimeters, or, or, excuse me, 30 millimeters with a negative 16 degree taper, you can see it actually kind of gets. Uh, whoops, uh, we we actually get this weird cape tapered cone thing, uh, and it's just not what we're looking for. We want to be able to select both the ring and this inner circle right here, but obviously. There is no circle. It's just uh, the you would just be clicking on the inside of that tube. So the idea is that you want to make a sketch on that top plane. Let's get a 3D view of that. Uh, and I want to project this ring surface. And you can see that it highlights in red the outside and the inside plane. So that will give me this ring surface that I can click and also this inner circle. So then when I go to extrude, I can actually click the ring and this inner circle profile, and they can be treated as the exact same thing. So I'm taking information from that plane and basically projecting it onto the exact same surface. I'm taking yeah. the same information that's already there and making it usable. Yeah, I think that's a great explanation. So one question I have for you is why, why is it that Fusion does not allow you to click on that cylindrical surface in the middle without projecting that geometry? It's because this surface or this circle right here, it actually doesn't exist. Uh, if I undo that sketch really quick, uh, you can see that obviously I can click the top surface of that cylinder. That's fine. But if I want to click the circle, it doesn't exist. I would be selecting the inner tube uh, of this. It's kind of like saying if I dig a hole, if I go to the beach and dig a hole, you know, why can't, why doesn't my shovel hit? the top of the hole. It's like, well, it doesn't exist. It's, <laughs> it's slightly philosophical. It is, um, yeah, it's very philosophical. But if you could then take a picture of that hole and print it out, then you can obviously touch the picture of the sand and touch the picture of the top of the hole. That's kind of what we're doing. Uh, and so with that, we can obviously com uh, combine both those profiles and treat them as one. And that's how we get our tapered cylinder. So this is a really good example of the project and all the kind of random stuff that you can I, do in I, that. And, and I, I kind of want to hit on something here as well. So uh, Al, one of the things that you're going to want to do is uh, basically experiment. Play around with the tool so much that you get an intuitive sense of what that tool does. I think uh, the, the trick with... And we'll get to some of the philosophy later. We do want to talk philosophy a little bit. But the trick with our program is just to keep jamming through it. You won't always know why we do what we do. But as you do it more often, and as you experiment with the things that you do, you'll start to uncover what a tool actually does. Things that are hard to describe in words, for example, that cylinder doesn't really exist, and, and yet you look at it and you say, well, but it's there on my screen, so what do you mean it doesn't <laughs> exist, right? Uh, so you start to gain an intuitive understanding of what that even means when we say it doesn't exist, it's not a part of the geometry, it's not a part of the sketch. Uh, so, so play around with the tools, and, and I, I like to try to break them, you know, and I put that in quotes, but... I like to try to use a tool in such a way that it either breaks it or un, kind of unveils the tool's inner workings. So Definitely. drawing circles and squares and using the tool and trying to project it on the different planes, just kind of get in there and play with that tool a bunch. Uh, the other thing I'll do sometimes is I will, uh, our program is pretty good, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be 100% of everything that you need at all times. So pop back into YouTube, pop back into the, the Autodesk forums, that's, that's a great time to go and explore a little bit. But the caveat there is don't do it too much. Keep working through these projects and just trust that by using these tools often enough, you, you'll gain that understanding of what they actually do. Totally agree. Um, it, is, it is very, very unsettling when people are learning a new program and we say, yeah, explore, try and mess around. Because people go, but I, I don't know how but to I, But I don't around. have the instructions. Yeah, but I, I don't have the instructions. I know. Step. It's like, well, it's that's, like, that's, part, that's, that's part of the point. Yeah, part of the you point. will absolutely um, be running into areas where you go, I don't understand what's going on. And that's Al, perfectly fine. Um, yeah, Al, let us know in the chat if that, if, if that explanation makes sense to you as well. Um, yeah. You know, if, if, if at least some of this discussion about uh, that tool resonates with you. So very curious to know. Definitely. Uh, and just to follow back up on that question, he was also asking about the include. Uh, so for some reason, you guys can see my model, but you can't see any of the tools that I open, really strangely. Um, and so uh, essentially, anytime you are working uh, with projects, there's also the other tool called include or intersect. 
uh, intersect. Uh, we actually use it in the surfboard projects, essentially where you have a body and you can slice uh, through a plane, maybe something you're sketching on, and it will actually uh, project all the information about where your body intersects with it. If you have a cylinder that you're looking head on and you make a sketch on the front of it, then obviously as it cuts through that, it will show you a rectangle because that's what's cutting it in half. Obviously, uh, so if I was to have a visual mind, maybe yeah, not to those yeah. who don't. So if I was going to make a new sketch on here and I would go into the create menu, oh, it doesn't seem to be opening, uh, and I would actually be cutting this away, you would actually see this bottom line uh, and then a line on either side, and it would come up to some tapered edges. Just like the project tool, it does make it into a purple line. You can kind of imagine it like a projection, um, but really, really useful. I use these tools all the time. Awesome. All right, so we've got some more. Uh, let's see. Any tips for, Fantastic. let's put this new one on the screen here. Any tips for pre preventing auto constraints? Actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but can you hold control and draw things and it will not constrain it at all? Is that, uh, am I remembering that correctly? Say that again. If you, if you hold Try, control. Hold control and draw. We're discovering things as we go here. Uh, yeah, if you hold no. control and no, it won't let you do anything. Nah. That's not yeah, no. Okay. That's uh <laughs> ignore that. We're just learning together. That's fine. Yeah. No, uh it, if you try and uh try and add any constraints of any kind. So uh, if I try and put a midpoint on this line, uh obviously it's gonna be snapping to that center point. That's where we get yeah. the triangle. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be adding in constraints. Sometimes they are tremendously useful. Uh, but I would say that the real trick around it is to essentially expect when they're going to happen and either saying yep, it is actually what I want, or saying, no, I absolutely do not want uh, that auto constraint to pop up. And that's where you can go in and basically select that constraint icon and then delete it. So if so I for, have- For example, the circle. Hey, Fab Lab Maker Hub. I think that's uh, Stuart. Yeah. How's it going, Stuart? Oh, very cool. Uh, all textbooks should be this good, he says. That is, we are flattered. Thank you very that much. is so nice of you. So nice of you. Uh, um, as we, as we said example, before, back, as we said before, Real quick for Stuart. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, we we spent way too much time making this book. Way too much. There we it's very obvious why most textbooks don't behave like ours after you do it. Yeah, With lots of pain. yeah. Anyways, uh, so constraints. So going back to auto constraints, some of them are really handy, and some of them you essentially just need to be aware that this happens. Uh, some most of the times you do want the auto constraint. But if you don't want it, we'll show you how to get rid of it. So a very, very common thing that people do is they'll draw a circle and they'll draw a line coming off of it. And depending on the angle, at a certain point, you will actually get that little tangent constraint. So you can see where the uh, where the left point of the line, at a certain point, this will snap. There you go. And it gives us that little tangent constraint. So if I click that, it's automatically going to be putting in this constraint. In fact, it does the exact same thing as if I were to uh, add on a tangent constraint to a circle. Uh, as you can see, it pops up the exact same uh, icon. Uh, and this is something that you can totally get rid of. If you do not want it, you don't have to. You can click on it and hit delete, and then that will completely get rid of it. So I don't know if there's a way to turn off auto, uh, auto constraints, but I would say 90% of the time you actually do want it. So don't shy away from it. Yeah, and then it's just that little UI hint, right? You can go back in and see that tiny little icon and delete it. Yeah. Uh, but that brings me to another point. Can you always see those icons? Or are those constraints sometimes you... hidden? So sometimes they're hidden. So you guys can't see my sketch palette on the right-hand side if for some reason it's totally blank. <laughs> That's so uh, but one, I know, very strange. Uh, I'm just going to add on some constraints here. We'll put on uh, another tangents right there. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we have the sketch palette. This is the tool that I always tell people just to collapse and get out of the way because it takes up so much screen real estate. And it's really not full of a ton of useful tools. So you can basically get rid of it. Um, if we also add on uh, some dimensions really quick, uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, one of the buttons on here that you can check or uncheck would be dimensions. So obviously you can click that and it gets rid of it. Uh, one of them is also constraints. You can see the tangent icon disappears on there. Uh, there's there's a bunch of tools on here, and I generally tell people to just leave it. For example, you can turn off the sketch grid, which is not useful to do. You should basically always keep the uh, the grid on. Um, you can get rid of the profiles. You can get rid of uh, any of the points in here. Uh, 
And to be honest, a lot of them fall into the category of why would you want to get rid of it? Some of them are really obvious. If you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, constraints and uh, dimensions everywhere, then hiding it just for a quick second is fine. But the idea of getting rid of it for the entire project, um, I would probably advise against it. So you may as well keep them on. So tips for preventing auto constraints. I see an, a message in the chat here too. Autodesk says use control, but that does nothing for my testing. Yeah, apparently it does nothing yeah. for our testing as well. So uh, TBD on, uh, on preventing auto constraints. Uh, I, actually, maybe we'll explore that a little bit more this week and see what we come up with next week. But uh, yeah. yeah, let me know if that answered some of the rectangle, some of the patterning problems. I'm guessing it was a patterning problem uh, with mm. the rectangle. Uh, we, we don't yeah. actually use the rectangle. Oh, no, we do use the rectangle tool in that. I was thinking we drew three uh, lines, yeah. not the rectangle tool. Yeah, oh, righty then. Okay, so that one will hide. I had another one. Let's see. A if... tiny little tip and trick for everyone that's here. You may as well learn something. Um, you can actually make tangent arcs to lines automatically without, uh, without using two separate tools. Uh, if you click L for the line tool, you can click anywhere you want. Uh, you can actually click and then move and click again to make a line, obviously. But if you hold down your mouse, you can actually then make a tangent arc off of it and then release. And then you can make another one if you want. Um, yeah, super useful tool. Just cool. in case anyone actually cares. Oh, people definitely care. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we have another one here. So any tips? So we got the auto constraints. Thanks for that question. Let us know if that cleared a little bit of it up. Next up is Joe Street. I don't know if you guys get deeper into it because I'm only in the midpoint of chapter one, but you guys dive into parametric designs using the change parameters we totally tool. do. Yes. We, we totally do. do. This is yeah. chapter three. Yes. Uh, parametric design for everyone that doesn't know is massively useful. In fact, uh, Fusion and the majority of CAD softwares are actually already parametric. So as the name implies, parametric deals with parameters. Uh, you can think of any dimensions as a parameter, but parameter is more of a general umbrella term for any information or data uh, that you can add some math to or some equations to or some relationships between uh, two or more dimensions at a time. The idea is that if I am designing in a CAD program like Fusion and I make a box uh, and I add in a height, a width, a length, uh, all of those three dimensions are things that I can change and edit. Uh, it's not set in stone. I can always we, go back and edit something. So I want to interrupt you for one second. We actually yeah. have an introduction to parametric in the chapter three intro. <laughs> And we mm -hmm. show you the difference between drawing, I think, three rectangles with yeah. individual dimensions on those rectangles versus having them be parametrically driven, uh, which is, by the way, a little bit confusing because Fusion is a parametric software and then there are parameters Inside. within the parametric software. And so this, there's a bit of confusion around what this term actually means, I think. I we, and it uh, we can do a context. really good example. So we can do some good examples for this that I kind of like. So I'm going to make three different rectangles three different ways. So I'm going to be making this one, this first one right here. Technically, it does have some dimensions. If I click on any of these lines, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the comment might be hiding it a little bit. Uh, but anytime you click on a line, it'll actually tell you exactly how long it is in the bottom right-hand corner. So this one says it's got a width of 130 millimeters and a height of 128. It's almost a square. We couldn't see um, that, so, but you have to trust oh, uh, us. I, the comment was hiding. Does it show? Oh, it actually doesn't show up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it did. There it is. There it is. There you go. So if you click bottom it, right it pops up right on the bottom. It does the same thing for circles as well. If you click this, it'll show the diameter. If you click the inside, it'll show the area. Super duper handy tool. Highly yes, recommend you guys get yes, into it. Yes, 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 yes. Anyway, yes. so I haven't put in any parameters whatsoever. I've just, or I haven't put in any dimensions. I've just drawn a rectangle. And this is actually already applied uh, a scaling fact, because it has to know roughly how big things are. Uh, you can see my sketch grid right here in the back. It has 250 mil, 500 mil, 750 mil. So it needs to have some reference of exactly how big something is, even if I haven't directly said exactly how big it is. Uh, the next rectangle that I'm going to do, uh, I will actually add some dimensions. Let's say this one wants to be 175 by... Uh, let's say 125. There we go. So I have now added in some dimensions. You can also say I've added in some parameters. These are user parameters, though. 
Uh, and I know that they're parametrically driven because I can actually double click this and change it. I can edit those values. So I can always uh, extrude this into a, into a cube and make a hole and round the corners and add chamfers or a threaded hole or whatever. And I can still go back and edit this to be whatever size I want. It is always going to be parametrically driven by the parameters. I think that's pretty easy for people to understand. Uh, the sec or the third thing that I can do is actually use parameters uh, to actually drive this. Oh, you guys can't see this pop up. Yeah, we can't see any of the pop ups. It's so weird. That's We're gonna have to fix we'll try to I fix that for next week. I know. If, if um, there's actually a little cheat code. So uh, I'm actually going to be typing in. Oh, you guys can't see this box either. Lame. Uh, I'm going to be <laughs> typing uh, width equals 175 and hit enter. And you can see this now says uh, 175. So if you go into modify and go to change parameters there at the bottom, you'll actually see a parameter that says width equals 175. So if you then uh, uh, dimension uh, the height of it, I can also type in W for width and then hit enter. You can now see it says FX, which is a function, um, 175. So these two values equal exactly the same thing. So now the height is parametrically driven by the width. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but it's, it's fairly easy to do. In fact, you can change this. You can say uh, two times the width. So this now makes it 350 millimeters tall. Yeah, I, so I think the ability to add math is math. hugely important. I, it's like it simplifies your thinking, and I think that's a one mm -hmm. of the big one of the big reasons why a it's hard to learn this stuff, but b when you when you do really get it, it's great. Is that you start to figure out quicker and quicker and quicker ways to actually conceptualize of a design, and then to make it within that sketch palette, or you know, definitely like if you know you're going to have three hundred circles that are exactly the same diameter. And you want to try to dimension 300 circles, you just completely ruin your life. Good <laughs> luck. Like, you, know, you just you just ruin your ability to get anything done. So uh, the, the classic joke is that you've got uh, you, you tell two people to make pegboard in CAD, uh, 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 <laughs> and one person runs out of time. It's like yeah, one way will take five minutes, and the other one will take five hours. Yeah, that's absolutely absolutely. All right, we got some new people in the chat too. Um, all right, let's see. So. Let's Joshua, let us know. Let us know if that answered some questions. Uh, do scroll to chapter three, read that introduction section, and work through some of those designs. Um, we funny thing that we get here. Uh, we, we've had a bunch of questions on the Discord about skipping projects. We've let's let's jump into this really quickly, Jake. So mm -hmm. when we design this book, it's really important that you understand we designed this book with CAD in mind. So the big skill that we're trying to convey throughout this entire book is how to actually make the 3d or the the sketches and then the 3d designs on top of those sketches so when we introduce something like appearances the lesson really isn't so much about appearances as it still is about the cat we we talk about yeah. tools we talk about new tools in every single lesson in this entire book so if you skip a lesson and and you don't actually work through at least the cad portion of it there's a good chance that you've missed some core functionality of fusion that we discussed in there so i, I just wanted to clear that up and and encourage you all not to skip lessons, at least as far as the CAD is concerned. You can absolutely skip the lesson after CAD. So, if, for example, if you're going to make the skateboard or the electric guitar, you by no means have to do the CAM portion of that. If you're never going to manufacture it, if you're like, hey, this is a different, different workspace. My brain is overloaded already. I don't need this. That's fine. But highly recommend you do work through the CAD. I, I'll actually extend off of that. So most of the time we have... Uh, especially in the later chapters when we go into new workspaces and new environments, uh, we have two separate projects um, on purpose. The first one is very, very basic. For example, the longboard, the CAD takes what? 10 minutes? Max? Yeah, it's not long. Yeah, by that point, you, very, can, very you can do it really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's all about now, okay, we're going to be taking the simple project and pulling it into a brand new workspace. And we're going to be showing you guys not only the very basics of this workspace, but how to make a very simple project. And then the second project, the CAD is much more intensive and the uh, the project in the new workspace is much more intensive as well. So you can essentially say, all right, well, I did the, uh, the longboard CAD and I did the longboard CAM. And you may find that I don't care at all about the CAM. That's totally fine. That is completely okay. What we want you to do 
is to say, well, it's another string to my bow. I know it exists. I know what it can do. And then if, say, two, three years down the line, you go, okay, well, I've used up all of my 3D printers. I'm now, you know, wanting a new toy to play with. Uh, I want to get into CNC. And you go, oh, I actually do. I don't know everything about it, but I certainly know where uh, where to start, where the jumping off point is. And that's where you can refer back to our book. So if, then take on the electric guitar cam, which is much more intensive. So I absolutely recommend people dipping their toe into the water and doing the first project. Uh, but by no means are we going to be forcing you guys to do uh, the second one at all. My so favorite cool. is my favorite is the the render and the appearances tool. Is we hear this yeah. almost universally. I'm never mm -hmm. going to use that. Yes. I'm never going to use that tool. And then everybody and then, uses it. Everybody. everybody does because it turns yeah. out like the gray, the default gray steel. It makes it hard to see between components. There's there's this element it's of fine. There's this element of realism that brings your idea to life, mm -hmm. in a way that is very difficult without adding appearances. You don't. I don't render very often, so render. But I do use appearances on basically everything. Yeah. So uh, for a lot of people that don't uh, that don't know all the way, the, uh, the there's essentially three separate stages in uh, appearances. Uh, within Fusion 360. The default is if you make an object, if you make an uh, airport case, it is going to be starting off as this very boring default steel gray. doesn't look tremendously exciting. Um, and if you have multiple components that are right next to each other, it's a little hard to see uh, what's going on because they all kind of blur together. The next step is very, very simple to then add on an appearance where you can say, all right, well, this is white ABS. So I just go into the appearance, search ABS, and click and drag onto it, and automatically it looks better. If you're making, I don't know, uh, some electronic component and you know it's going to be made out of aluminum, well, then you can just find aluminum, click and drag on there, and it looks so much better. So and if you're making a project with dozens of components, and you know all of them are made out of different materials, different paints, different finishes, then you can actually make it look significantly more realistic. And it's actually way more helpful to actually do all your CAD projects because you know what everything is. There's a, certain, uh, there's a certain amount of realism, a certain amount of tactility to it. So I cannot recommend it enough. And for the clients stage... and portfolios oh, and yes. showing off yes. your work. And you know, for anybody that's interested in turning this into a career or a mm -hmm. uh, portfolio for college admission, whatever it happens to be, game changer. Uh, you yeah. have got to put appearances on these things. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. Also, here's a little trick. If you guys ever get into doing some CAD work, maybe you go into Fiverr and you say, hey, I can design your products for very, very low money. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> the number one thing that I highly recommend people do is say, hey, can I just get like a JPEG of your, uh, of your company logo? And every product that you do, if you add on uh, the decal of their product <laughs> logo onto their surface, they go wild. They, go back they back. absolutely yeah. love it because it is so powerful because it adds uh, a huge amount of realism. Not, not visually. It obviously, it still looks like a computer model, but it adds so much more tactility. You can imagine what it would look like in real life. Moral of the story, uh, don't you... skip lessons. Yeah, don't skip lessons. <laughs> uh, if you then go, I want to then make a realistic image of this to show to my client, then you can go into the rendering and you can learn about lighting and cameras and setting up a stage a set uh, and then re go the whole nine yards and it is really pretty good i've I, i've yeah. seen many renders that i yep. couldn't tell that they were renders at all and even and a lot of times um, even if you can tell you can get it good enough for the client or for yourself to imagine it in that scenario yeah which uh which is yeah. what ikea is really good at right you walk into ikea, IKEA and they stage the entire store so that it feels like you're sitting in a room I think that's kind of the equivalent in CAD where you want to stage it like it is. Um, shall we move on to another question? Yes. Uh, so Edward, hopefully you're still Edward, still here, Edward. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put his comment up here. So he says, is there a minimal height for an arc in Fusion? I noticed I couldn't make an arc less tall than I believe 0.9 millimeters while working on the ring project. 0.9 millimeters tall. No. So uh, you can go infinitely small, infinitely large. Uh, infusion again it's just kind of the scale of the universe uh, let me go ahead and share my screen again um it is uh or there shouldn't be any problem with uh making arcs of any height 
uh, at all. I'll just go ahead and add uh, some constraints to these. Make this a quarter arc. Uh, so we, so very obviously, you can make this 0.9 millimeters, and it just becomes very, very, very tiny. Uh, side note for anyone that accidentally does this, where they make a sketch uh, that's way too small, oh, yeah. and then dimension lines. It's a good side note. Good side, good note. side note. You do not need to zoom out and click and drag this in. Total waste of time. You can just click this dimension lines and drag it, and it comes down for you. It's magic. Beautiful. That's one of my favorite tricks. It's so good. Uh, we actually made a YouTube short about this. If you guys are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, we post three tips and tricks every single week. Different interviews, different projects. Ton of fun. Yeah, if you're not subscribed um, yeah. to us, definitely subscribe because we're we're trying to provide only value, right? So click the subscribe. Make sure you check out those shorts. They are mm -hmm. putting a lot of love into those. Yeah. What I think is going on with Edward's uh, project is that it's, at, it's coming up with an error because something else is over-constrained. Uh, if you have something else in your sketch that's actually limiting how tall or how small something can be, then it's actually going to throw up a big fat error saying, this is mathematically impossible to draw. And something else is going, something else is going wrong. Um, so I would absolutely, in that scenario, just recommend uh, if you have some lines and some arcs coming off of all of this, um, kind of picking it apart and saying, all right, well, which line, which geometry, which curve is actually um, causing the problem. So you can, if you'd like, you can just go ahead and click and delete uh, any line, and then you can just go Control or Command Z uh, and bring it back up. Uh, so going going into yeah, any of it, you can delete and then re-add to find out exactly what was the problem. Uh, even more so, uh, next to the undo, there's a little arrow you can drop down, and you can see uh, That's it's funny because can't we well. can't see. <laughs> uh, you can see a list of every single uh, operation and step that you've done, uh, even to the minutia, and you can see exactly what stage do you want to jump to. That's a really nice tool as well. Awesome. All right, give me another All question. Right. Yeah, I'm Edward, hungry for another one. Yeah, this is good stuff. Uh, okay, so hide that one. Let's see. Parametric, okay, loving it. CNCs. Doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat, but we do have questions that we had on the Discord that we figured we'd dive into, right? So we talked we talked about not skipping projects, the importance of not skipping projects because we designed these to specifically introduce new tools as you progress. Mm -hmm. So don't skip projects we talked about. Uh, why don't we dive into something early? Second project we do is the Mobius strip. And one yeah. of the things about the Mobius strip is that there's this idea of fully defined. If it's not fully defined, sweep doesn't work. Uh, and we had a couple questions on the Discord about it. So can you can you expand on what's happening with the Mobius Strip project? Yeah, let me just uh, change around the uh, the parents really quick. There we go. All right. So the Mobius Strip is uh, it's a very simple project. I think everyone can do it uh, within probably half an hour. Um, but the big headline of it is that you essentially have two separate sketches at the bottom. You've got your rectangular profile down here, and then you have your circular path. You can see right through it. Uh, you are using the sweeping tool to essentially send the rectangular profile around uh, around the circle. And if you add in a zero degree taper, then this gives you this kind of squared off rectangular donut. Uh, and because you have a twist angle, we can make a Mobius strip, which is a really funky uh, geometric shape. It's part of a, a branch of mathematics called topology, which is the most bizarre, <laughs> the most bizarre scientific field. I've ever seen this is essentially a 3D object uh, that only has one side. Uh, if you take a strip of paper uh, and you give it a half twist and then pin it together, there is no front side and back side. It just continues infinitely in place. So uh, I this is kind of a uh, three dimensional climb. Bomb. I've got an idea, yeah. Jake. I think we should cut a chamfer in this and we should run some LED lights and actually hang it as a light. That would be really cool. Oh, I've yeah, been meaning we, to. I, um, let's do it. Let's put a, let's put a channel in there. I've got some LEDs. We'll 3D print that's it. That's actually that's a great idea. And then we'll like hang it up in the backdrop of the video next week. I dig it. I've been meaning to because uh, I have some clear resin to SLA print a Klein bottle, and then drop yeah. a little marble in there. You can see just how it like it never comes out. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Uh, so the big back to this. So the big problem with this is that a ton of people when they do the sweep, they get a big fat warning on the bottom. Anytime you're doing something that you shouldn't be. It's either going to throw up a warning symbol, which is a little yellow triangle with the exclamation mark in the middle, 
or it's going to throw a red, which is even worse. This is when something <laughs> is really, really wrong. You messed up. How dare you? Uh, it's also going to be highlighting in the timeline exactly where you went wrong and which stage it is. Uh, and if you right click on any of the warnings, obviously we don't have any right now, but if you right click on it in the timeline, it'll actually give you a little pop up that says exactly what it is. And then you can copy that, uh, that error message, uh, and just put it to Google and it'll, it'll absolutely bring you to a forum where people have figured out exactly what's gone wrong. So, I don't know about that. I, I might just, I might disagree with that. It'll absolutely bring you somewhere where you're not sure if it's useful or not. So some of it'll those bring warning labels, to, yeah. <laughs> some it'll of those warning labels are non yeah. It's like error. There's a problem. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say that most of them will take you to a forum where people have had the problem in the past. Yes. There's zero guarantee whether it was solved <laughs> or if it was solved, if you can understand the, yeah. the solution. <laughs> the majority of the time, uh, yeah. Yep. Mini rent. one of the reasons that we uh, made the Discord, that we made uh, the Zoom links, so we made uh, all of the kind of community building within our program is that from just a sheer place of frustration, Josh and I hate the forums uh, and most most forums as well. Uh, Josh is very, very, very good with Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Me, not so much. So anytime that I was running into a problem and I would go onto any forums, it would just be full of people that are experts uh, and they just want to show off. And that's they want to they want to make you just, feel as just stupid as possible. That's the goal. Yeah. I think a lot of this, like yeah. that's one of those internet troll things. We won't dive too deep into that topic, but yeah, oftentimes when you start diving into the world yeah. of CAD questions, it seems as though people write the answers to make you feel stupid. Yeah, which sucks. So our Discord is all about stupid questions and stupid answers. I yes. don't care how <laughs> simple or stupid your question is, we will always try and answer it every single time. Uh, right, because so... we've all been there. We've all been learning a new program. Anyway, totally. going back yeah. to this, uh, <laughs> the big thing that people run into, <laughs> sidebar, uh, is that anytime they sweep and they get an error, it's because one of their sketches is undefined. So if you expand this, oh, you guys can't see it either. Uh, we have two sketches right here. We have the rectangular and we have the circular. And on all of this, you should see a little red padlock just below where it says sketch one and sketch two. This means that your sketch is fully defined and the location and the size of the sketch totally locked down. It cannot be moved. If you have uh, your circular profile that is not exactly constrained, it can move off to the side potentially, um, then it will completely fail. So let's try and force an error into this. Uh, so one of the one of the very common things is that people will make a circle. That's fine. Uh, they will add on the dimension. That's fine. But then they won't vertically constrain this. I'm just going to go ahead and delete uh, this. And then we can actually move this off to the side just a little. I'll even move it slightly less than that. So if you zoomed out, you probably can't actually tell that it shifted off to the side. But it obviously is blue. This is movable. This is undefined. So if you try and do this, there you go. We get a warning on here. It still works. I'll actually try and remake this. Um, Oops. Oh, strange. Won't let me pull that down. Anyway, um, uh, as soon as you try and make, uh, as soon as you try and make this, it'll say error. You cannot make uh, this sweep, and that's because the uh, the rectangular profile where it touches. Uh, the circle, if it's coming out on this side, it isn't exactly tangent. It's actually going off an angle, a very slight angle, but it just won't allow it at all. So that's why anytime you're making sketches, unless we specifically say so, you need to make sure that it is totally constrained. So constrained I'm going to go back defined. into here. Constrained and defined, yeah. So if I add on a vertical constraint between these two points... Then we're good to go. And that yellow warning down there has totally disappeared. Has gone away. Then it means that we have everything good to go. Awesome. Uh, there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. Yeah. <laughs> That's what uh, PC... I don't know how to say this. PC Van Vliet. That's what I'm going to call it. PC Van Vliet. It says, there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. I would agree with you most of the time. Sometimes the stupid questions are really questions that have already been answered, but you didn't listen. So I remember when we were teaching live oh, in the classroom, fine. I'm like, actually, there are no stupid questions, but the same question twice because you didn't hear the original answer. Now I'm no. 
now it's a stupid question. <laughs> but uh, no, I agree with you. I think especially when you're learning CAD is uh, you don't know what you don't know. So mm -hmm. ask the question. Uh, okay. So I have, let's see. Let's do a shout out to some awesome projects we've seen. Shall we do that? Good idea. Are you able yeah. to pull Discord up and scroll through it a little bit? Um, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and stop let's, sharing this. Let's have a look. We had a couple of really cool projects, and we've had a bunch. I want to give a couple shout outs kind of in the middle of this stream. We'll try to shout out the cool stuff that's going on. Um, and then if you guys have more questions in the chat, pronunciation is excellent. It's Dutch. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got lucky. Uh, all right, so the Discord. Right. So pop in. Let's uh, the I made a thing. One of my favorites. I made a thing. I when you love guys make page. stuff, I this yeah. Can can we just can we talk about this for a second? So Jake and I made this program because we want people to make amazing things. So the I made a thing channel is for these amazing things, and this this project by Johnny Three D is so cool. So Jake, do you want to talk about it's... lock picking a little bit? Okay, uh, very very simply lock picking. I don't know if you guys can see on here. Uh, lock picking is uh, the idea that all of the ridges on a key are essentially very specific heights. And when you put a key in, you are pushing all of these pins that are different lengths. And if you put the right key in the right lock, then all of these pins will kind of get pushed up to different amounts where the top of them is totally flat. There's now no interference and then you can then turn the lock. And uh, above all these pins are little springs and little locking mechanisms. So if you can go in there with a little uh, hook-shaped pick uh, and you can click them in the right order and push it up to the right amount, uh, then everything is locked in place and then you can get a wrench just below it and open it up. Uh, super cool. You can actually go in there with a special hook that kind of looks like a 2D brush and kind of brush it back and forth and that will just by sheer randomness click all of the individual pins in different orders and lock it in place uh, as far as i know um you can get into any lock within like five seconds with the right tools side note i tried to get into this when i was a kid because i thought it was fascinating uh and i suck i was never even <laughs> able to get into a padlock side note i did teach myself how to uh, how to pick handcuffs really well because i was I was always into uh, escapology. That's the study of escaping things like Harry Houdini. So I can pick out of uh, handcuffs with a paperclip in like 10 seconds, I think. That's amazing. So, uh, uh, but, uh, so yeah. sh shout out to the design. That's a really cool design. Holds the mechanism, holds the pins. Oh, it's like fantastic. Uh, holds some of the small tools. This is the kind of stuff. This is why we did this. You know, and, and we can't wait to see what you guys make. You know, this, the whole goal of this program, and I think uh, it's, it's easy to get lost. We have 28 step-by-step -step projects. So you can, you can just go through the entire book and just work through our projects. But that's not really the goal. The goal no. is as you start to gain that confidence, make the things that you want to make. Design the things that mm -hmm. you want to design. You have the skills. After a couple of weeks, you do actually have some skills. So we love to see this. Uh, keep going. There are a couple other projects, I think, in here that we haven't shouted out before. Um, this, yeah, this we have Joe Street. Bots, who's, I love, love it. it. He's on our stream right now. So awesome, Joe Street. Oh, we love that design. Dude. Um, that was an awesome project. Yeah, super, super cool. I can't wait to see what you do with uh, with your battle bots. Uh, yeah. As you get better with fusion and as things get more complex, mm -hmm. like, yes, awesome. Uh, uh, Josh and I recently went to Open Source Live 2023 up in San Francisco, which is the, uh, the convention. It's kind of like Make a Fair, but uh, it was put on by William Osman uh, and Alan Pan, Michael Reeves. Um, it was It was heaven for makers uh it was full of every single maker youtuber you can imagine uh it was just so so much fun adam savage mark roba oh gosh uh, i made a thing uh we got to chat with joseph prusha 3d printing nerd jbv creative oh my gosh our jbv, uh, actually... our JBV interview goes live today at two o'clock oh fantastic so if you guys are yeah, fans um... of jbv creative if you're not go go subscribe to his channel it's amazing yeah, leave okay. this live. Go and subscribe yeah. to him and come back. He is <laughs> phenomenal. He's also incredibly nice in real life. Really, um, really nice. But, yeah. but, they, but in this convention, they had uh, a mini uh, section just for the BattleBots. And the BattleBots were only about this size. Uh, and they had this huge queue with plexiglass. And you could see burns and smashed glass. And they had a wooden <laughs> border inside that was destroyed and splintered. Uh, and I absolutely loved seeing it. So 
battle bots totally something that i want to uh, that i want to get into yeah oh yeah oh uh, yeah totally fine. side note uh josh and i are going to be speakers at the new maker fair that's yes. going to be uh, in yes. roseville in california uh in october Stuart. 12th. Stuart. so Stuart is asking right now will we be in the bay area for maker fair and will we be filming content yes, yes we will Absolutely. we will be we will speaking we will be filming we'll be talking to creators uh, so yes, we absolutely will. And hopefully, actually, I think Jake, let's do a couple live sessions from there. Uh, I so would we'll love it. That on, sounds a ton of fun. We'll pop on at some point during the weekend and do some live mm -hmm. streaming, uh, maybe even live stream a talk, but you know, technical yeah. details. We'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, Stuart. We'll so Stuart, let us know if you will be there. And of course, if any of you in the chat are going to be there, uh, do let us know. We're going to have a, we're going to book a place for the entire week. So if you happen to be going to the Bay area and you're going to stay for that week, let us know. Uh, we'd love to host you and meet you in real life. Yeah. If you guys see us uh, the convention, if uh, I think Josh and I are going to be giving a few speeches, a few lectures, a uh, little classes here and there, just about 3D printing, CAD. Uh, we may set off an explosion. Who knows? We're going to launch, um, some, we're gonna launch some air powered rockets inside. We're going to do some basic tutorials about how to make those quickly. We're going to fire yeah. them off at people like Dale. You know who doesn't yeah. know that yet, but uh, he's he's gonna be he's gonna have <laughs> rockets incoming. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, open phone. We met our first uh, our first student. It was phenomenal. Did you so say if open you guys phone? See Josh and I. Did I say open phone? Open, open source. Phone. We do use open An phone. phone. Amazing app. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, if you you if you see us uh, at Makerfair, absolutely stop us. Um, I want to take a picture with yeah. you guys. We love that. We'll be there. We want to see you in real life. In real in uh, in mm -hmm. the. In the real world. Uh, all right. Yes. So there's another there's another project question, and that is uh, the surfboard's blind. The surfboard's the blind. For yes. The, for the fin, this is for the a. Mm -hmm. uh, let me bring that up. So the surfboard is a really fun project, um, but it is definitely difficult. It is not for the faint of heart. So the surfboard definitely comes with some difficulties. Turn off the grid. There we go. Um, and uh, specifically what we're talking about is the actual profile of the surfboard fin at the bottom. This is where a lot of people get tripped up. And it comes back to that automatic constraints we talked about at the beginning of the stream. Uh, this makes life a little bit more tricky than it needs to be. Uh, fair enough. But running into problems and fixing it by yourself is the best way to learn CAD. So I'm just going to be opening up this sketch. Oh, and this one actually isn't fully defined. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this spline. So uh, the first thing we do in this sketch is we project, or excuse me, we include uh, the profile of the surfboard. That's why the edges are purple. Then we make a circle, and we uh, define exactly where it is uh, from the origin. So we make this circle totally defined. Then we make an arc. The arc has a tangent constraint to the circle, and it has a radius, and it has a starting dimension right there. So great, that's fully defined. The place where people get tripped up is when they try and make a spline to this, which is, uh, frankly, quite tricky. Uh, so I totally forgot the dimension of where it lives on this. I'm just going to make it up. But I'm going to be using the fit point spline tool. And I only need to actually click two points on this. Uh, a lot of people tend to have the idea that the more points that I use on a spline, the more complicated and accurate uh, my curve is going to get. Totally not true. The more complicated and areas for problems comes into that. So as and, few and, points and, as possible and, on the spline is the trick. And that's because the spline is really one of these tools that doesn't have definite dimensions, typically. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's, it's totally like, an artist. One of those. Thing. Yeah. It's actually a really good example because it's not parametric. It is uh, you are just adjusting all these vertices within the points and the endpoints of the uh, of the curves, and because you're not putting in any dimensions to it, it's organic. It's totally what you think looks right. That's one of the big uh, touching points we go over quite a lot in the book. Uh, it's not about what is correct or accurate. It's what looks good to you. If you uh, right. any of you guys have any woodworking experience you will know fundamentally inside you, you'll go, that doesn't look right. I've measured it, it's right, but I. But it doesn't look right. And very often, uh, you want to sand things down or cut things to where it looks right, not to where it's dimensionally correct. 
Uh, regardless of that tangent, I'm going to click somewhere <laughs> on this curve. You can see the little no pun intended. on there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be pulling away and clicking somewhere uh, on this circle. So you can see as I move it around, I still get that X, but I don't have the tangent constraint on there. So you can click uh, essentially anywhere. I'm going to click somewhere. Uh, eh, you actually can't. Somewhere. Well, you can click anywhere, but it's not going to necessarily work anywhere. Yeah, that's true. one of the issues they ran into. Yeah. The other thing is that um, you don't click enter or return. Uh, anytime you're done with the spline, you have to click this little check mark right there. This will add in this blue line. Uh, I'm going to click escape. And then these green lines right here, these are the vertices. This is what you can uh, click and adjust to move around. Uh, oops, there we go. So these are all things that we can uh, mess around with. Uh, we can also mess around with the end point of here as well. So I'm going to... Uh, without, or the first thing that I'll do is actually I will lock down uh, this endpoint right here. Normally, you'd put a dimension on there. That's fine. Uh, second thing is I'm going to be clicking this and adjusting to make roughly the curve that I'm looking for uh, with basically no dimensions whatsoever, no constraints uh, either. You can do that to this top one as well. Just make it look roughly correct, you know, mess around with the, uh, with the vertices of the spline. Then I'm going to add on uh, a tangent constraint between this spline and this circle. This will move the endpoint to the right location. And it may mess around with this vertices. So this is one of those things where I can now no longer adjust the angle of that vertice. I can only adjust the length of it. And that's going to be changing uh, around our curve. I can still mess around with the orientation of there. But as you can see, there is no right answer at all. You know, it's just whatever you think looks like a surfboard or if you don't if you've never surfed before or it looks like a what? fin at least yeah and we oh, have yeah. we good good buddy of ours does make custom surfboard fins so he probably oh, yeah. plays around with this quite a bit yeah um and because this is a spline because it's not something that you can define using dimensions this is when you have to go into the constraints and use the fix unfix tool you can see that little red padlock icon and then click on the spline which turns it green which essentially means stay there don't move. I don't care how big it is or where it is. It's organic or not defined. Just stay there. This does define it, though. A lot of people are confused by that. So if for uh, some reason... Us... Yeah, sorry. Keep going. Uh, this will now give us uh, our two profiles that we can then extrude uh, and then add on our little fillet right there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so and if for some reason it doesn't extrude... Uh, we the spline tool just creates all kinds of little funny issues. So one mm -hmm. of the things that I'll, I'll sometimes do is I'll just delete it, redo it, and in the slightest little nuance differences in that spline can make or break the fusion's ability to actually extrude it. So just be aware yes. that if for some reason something is broken in something that you've done, if you have splines, to me that's one of the first things I check. Let me just delete that yeah. spline. Add a line. Yeah. Can I extrude it if it's just a line instead of a spline? If the answer is yes, I'm like, okay, so then now let me mess around with my spline tool. Yeah, yeah, 100%. The spline is so Joestry. much more computationally heavy than people think. So Joestry says, uh, I did notice if you try to unfix the same spline, it locks it into place. Interesting. Hmm. If you try to yeah. unfix a spline, it locks it into place. So fix... Um, Oh, you know what? Sometimes I, I I have had issues. Yes, being able to manipulate that spline when when I act, when I yeah. fix and unfix. I think that's a fusion bug, and it doesn't happen to me all the time. That's yeah. That sounds like a fusion bug. Yeah. Well, we are uh, we are very in contact with the uh, the fusion team. Anytime we get or we run into a little problem, we reach out to them and say, "Hey, fix it." <laughs> yeah. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Um, all right, we don't have too much time. If you have any more questions, please put them in the chat. I have one more topic that is big, but we can keep it brief if we want. Um, I had somebody in my CNC class at Sac City College come in and tell me that they've reworked our introduction project a dozen times, over and over and over again. They went to our introduction class a dozen times, and they're like, they're recording every single tool that, that they're using as they're going through it, and they're doing it over and over and over again. And I actually told that student, and I would tell everybody on here as well, I think that's the wrong approach to our program. So I think the right approach to going through our program is to almost speed run through it. Don't worry too much about the names of things. Don't worry too much about what a tool does. 
don't worry too much about trying to cram your brain full of information. In some ways, I would say you have to anti-learn. In other words, yeah. like don't if you if you find yourself trying to think too hard about what it is that you're doing, stop thinking about it and just do it. I, I think this is very, very different from a from a teaching philosophy perspective inside of any classroom that you go in. It's like, oh, I got to remember the dates. I have to remember the the uh, the specifics. I have to remember what this tool does. There's going to be a test. There's going to be a quiz. Yeah, we have quizzes. But as you notice, you can take them 10 times. And the point isn't the point isn't what you got on the quiz. The point is, did you solidify your knowledge throughout that chapter at some point? Who cares if it took you 10 times to do it? So I, I, I just want to make a point that uh, learning doesn't have to be something that requires quote unquote effort. And going through our program, if you if you find yourself doing projects over and over and over again, I would recommend the opposite approach to that. Do one project, get through it, do the next project. And then at the end of the program, revisit those projects you found most, most interesting. Revisit yeah. those tools that you're still a little bit confused about. And now it's time to dive deeper. What do you feel about that, Jake? I, I would definitely agree to that. I, I would say that just doing the same project over and over again has merit as far as memorizing exact the tool exactly which tools to use, but it certainly doesn't help you become a better designer. Um, no. Anytime the, the the part of you that that is able to think the idea of a project and then executes it comes from doing your own projects, um, pulling inspiration from some of the projects that we do in this class, and then making uh, making it brand new for your own applications. Um, that's something that is almost impossible to teach design philosophy is just got to do it. it it's totally it's totally internal um, and what i what i do recommend and if you guys watch 3 uh, 3d printing generals uh, video uh, he actually remarks on this he comes across a problem or he comes across a question or a challenge that he's just totally stumped by totally doesn't understand it and will then continue onwards and then go backwards and try and do that again I highly recommend doing that. And you'll realize very quickly, oh my gosh, I thought chapter one was difficult when I first started. Now it's easy peasy. We got a new uh, question coming in? Yeah, one quick question. We got a couple minutes left here. So Stuart says, any tips on bringing STL files into Fusion so that it doesn't kill the application? Aha. You are, uh, yeah, choose a different program. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Autodesk, which is the mothership, the mother company, uh, and one of the one of their products is Fusion 360, uh, but there are dozens. I think about a hundred hundred programs that they make. Um, one of them is called Mesh Mixer. It is completely free. Uh, it will be getting absorbed into Fusion 360 in the future, so look out for that. But currently, it is fairly easy to understand. That is a program literally designed to handle STLs that have got tens, if not hundreds of thousands of polygons to it, which totally overwhelm uh, Fusion 360. I believe Fusion has like a maximum or warning uh, if you go above like 10,000 polygons, which you will hit very easily. Uh, in the uh, chapter three, the parametric design, our second project is the silicon mold where we import uh, a low polygon skull and then uh, make a fake box, fill it with silicone, subtract the skull, we know the volume of the silicone and then essentially able to, um, a lot more is fusion grinds. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's just not the program to use. Uh, fusion is great For in now. a lot of different avenues For now. but yeah, it's yeah. And we'll be definitely, definitely halts. Yeah. And hopefully we'll be on the track to, uh, getting early access to these fusion updates so we can update you. Yeah. Part, part of these segments will be some of those changes that impact design things like mm -hmm. that. But yeah, mesh, mesh um, is great. Yeah. I highly recommend, I believe uh, Maker's Muse on YouTube, he's the Australian uh, gentleman who does 3D printing videos, very high quality for like a decade now. I think one of his playlists is uh, all about mesh mix. He uses it all the time. He thought uh, Autodesk has discontinued mesh mix. I don't think so. I'm sure there's plenty of, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of copies yeah, uh, of sure. the direct that actually do have it. Um, so it's not just mesh mixer. Uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but you're basically looking for a mesh fixer program. Uh, and hey, uh, it, essentially. that is about it. So I wanted to say a couple things. One, uh, Jake, we didn't mention this on the on the pod, but we sold a thousand books. Yeah. So thank you. Thank, thank you so much to absolutely everyone. Here right now, all of you who are going to listen to this live stream later, 
from the bottom of our hearts, Jake and I, I, I had no idea that we would sell a thousand books in under three months. Yeah. Um, and the feedback Absolutely. we've gotten from you all has been amazing and wonderful and inspiring and basically universally positive. We've gotten very, very few negative comments about the book. And uh, you, when you create things in the world and you get some of that negative feedback, it can be a bit of a gut punch. Not that we're opposed to hearing what needs to be fixed. We're yeah. all about that. Absolutely. But, uh, absolutely huge. Thank you to all of you who show yes. up, to any of you who've interacted on the Discord, to those of you showing off the projects, and then a huge thank you to uh, what looks like a, a uh, referral engine. All of you are referring other people to our book, to our PDF. We're getting many, many downloads per day. I think we've had almost 2,000 downloads of our free book. We've had almost 1,000 donations from absolutely awesome and generous people. And it allows us to do stuff like this, which is hopefully help you all become better designers, tinkerers, makers, and builders. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And it was awesome being right, here today. Guys. Let us know if you have uh, questions, thoughts, ideas, concerns, anything about mm -hmm. format. And we will do this again next week. Jake, I love this format. I think this is awesome. I actually really love it. So any questions yeah. you guys have about absolutely anything, whether it's about the project or your personal projects, or maybe just any comments or concerns, absolutely post it on the Discord and we'll answer it next week. I'll awesome. see you guys later. Thanks I'm so Jake. much. And I'm Josh. Uh, adios.